Citigroup played a major role in crashing the U.S. market. It ended up getting a $45 billion taxpayer bailout to survive and eventually paid $7 billion to settle federal and state complaints. But to this day, the Justice Department hasn't charged any top bank executive with a crime. Not much has happened in terms of, from what I can see, to the actual people at Citigroup who were allegedly responsible for this behavior. I think that would be very accurate. Viagra helps guys with ED get and keep an erection. The patient used the drug um, shortly before wanting to initiate sex, but noticed within, within an hour or less after taking the drug that he lost vision in one eye. Pomeranians began to hear about similar cases and in 2005 published reports of 14 patients who went blind shortly after taking Viagra. At the time, the pharmaceutical industry put the warnings on the label, but insisted they really didn't think there was a link. Yet. Correct. This hacker helped shut down one of ISIS's most successful propaganda tools, but four questions keep him and the rest of the best from being hired by the FBI. Yeah, I can't imagine one person I know who, who would have the skill set to actually fulfill that job that would meet all those criteria. I know I wouldn't. Welcome to Full Measure, I'm Cheryl Atkinson. In the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, big banks paid tens of billions of dollars to settle state and federal fraud investigations, yet not one top bank executive was prosecuted. One investigator calls it the immaculate corruption. But buried in recently unsealed documents is a revelation. Major bank executives were referred to the Justice Department for possibly violating the law. A key whistleblower, Richard Bowen, is asking why none of them was charged. Richard Bowen knew where the figurative bodies were buried at banking giant Citigroup, once the largest company in the world. Over 60% of these mortgages in my largest area did not meet our guidelines. As a senior vice president, Bowen blew the whistle on Citigroup's practices leading up to the banking crisis. Practices like buying and selling risky mortgages and misrepresenting them to the public and investors. I started issuing warnings in June of 2006. I sent my warnings um, in a very wide distribution. I made committee presentations. I cornered people in the hallways. Executives, high ups? Absolutely. Citigroup played a major role in crashing the U.S. market. It ended up getting a $45 billion taxpayer bailout to survive and eventually paid $7 billion to settle federal and state complaints. But to this day, the Justice Department hasn't charged any top bank executive with a crime. This is the story of how systems intended to hold people accountable failed and Bowen claims even helped cover for them. Not much has happened in terms of from what I can see, to the actual people at Citigroup who were allegedly responsible for this behavior. I think that would be very accurate. In 2009, Congress created the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Six members were appointed by Democrats, four by Republicans. I witnessed business risk practices which made a mockery of city credit policy. Bowen was asked to testify, and he was eager to do it. It was a setting where he says he could publicly tell what he knew, exempt from a Citigroup confidentiality agreement. He wrote up his testimony, naming names and laying blame. But shortly before he testified, something mysterious happened. They went through and told me to take out much of the damning evidence that they had originally told me to put in. He says the commission wanted major edits. Now, what they also conveyed is that the edits were not optional. If I did not make the edits, I would probably be taken off the witness list. Bowen says he had to cut out eight pages, almost a third of his planned testimony. And almost nobody knew that when he testified on April 7, 2010. And I warned my business unit management repeatedly 
during 2006 and 2007 about the risk, risk issues I identified. Did they have you take out names of people yes. responsible? They had originally wanted me to put in the names and the specific instances of cover-ups that I had witnessed. All of that had to be taken out, at least the names. Financial Commission staff members who dealt with Bowen say the reason his testimony was shortened is simply because it was too long. They deny suggesting any edits, say there was no attempt to censor or silence Bowen, and say that all acted with the best of intentions and followed the highest ethics. The attorney who represented Bowen told us he agrees. Bowen was not censored. But that contradicts what he told the New York Times three years ago when he said, quote, there's no question that Bowen was censored. And in an email exchange right before Bowen testified, his lawyer said an official on the Financial Commission suggested some substantial changes. Quote, he thinks that the way it's written now, City will declare war on both you and the Financial Commission, and it will primarily consist of an effort to discredit you. The lawyer later added, I get the impression that the revisions are non-negotiable. Bowen, who saved notes, emails, and phone call transcripts, claims he was also advised not to discuss certain dealings with then Citigroup executive and former Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin. And so that information was effectively buried from public view. Also buried were work notes from the Financial Commission, which it decided to seal in the National Archives for five years. In March 2016, the Financial Commission's records were quietly unsealed for the first time, and we were able to obtain copies of Bowen's original testimony, including parts that were cut. As we look through these documents and we can see what they pulled out, what are some of the more remarkable phrases or sections they took out? The entire page talking about the fraudulent representations which were given to the purchasers of mortgage-backed securities. Uh, that was, I was forced to remove from my written testimony. There's an organizational chart. I gave them at their request an organizational chart that I put together consisting of the layers of management and the names involved of those that were aware of what was going on. He ended up removing that from his public testimony, too. Yeah. And there's something of a bombshell in the formerly hidden documents. In 2011, when the Financial Commission concluded work, it secretly determined some of the world's largest financial institutions had possibly violated securities law. The Financial Commission privately referred 11 charges against nine executives, including Robert Rubin and two other Citigroup officials, to Justice Department Attorney General Eric Holder for possible prosecution. The Financial Inquiry Commission had all this information and then they were tasked with making any criminal referrals to the Department of Justice. We now know that the Congressional Commission sent my criminal referral to the Attorney General. In other words, based in part on Bowen's testimony, the Financial Commission secretly recommended possible charges against top banking officials. But since the records were sealed, the public didn't know it. Now that the documents have finally been released after five years, Senator Elizabeth Warren has written the FBI and Justice Department Inspector General asking why nothing came of those criminal charge referrals. The Department of Justice has not filed any criminal prosecutions against any of the nine individuals, writes Warren. Not one of the nine has gone to prison or been convicted of a criminal offense. Not a single one has even been indicted or brought to trial. Citigroup declined comment. A spokesman for their one-time executive, former Secretary Rubin, told us the Justice Department never interviewed him and he only learned about the possible criminal referrals through media inquiries. The Justice Department and former Attorney General Eric Holder had no comment. In 2013, Holder said this about the big banks. I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to, um, to prosecute them. We did find one staunch defender of the lack of prosecutions, Peter Wallison, a Republican-appointed member of the Financial Commission, or FCIC. Do you feel like those referrals were properly handled based on what we know? There were never any prosecutions of individuals. Yes. It's very hard for uh, prosecutions to occur on, crim on a criminal level unless you have the levels of proof that are demanded by the courts and the juries. 
And Wallison has his own take that. on the so Financial we, Commission's flaws and has written about them in hidden in plain sight, what really caused the world's worst financial crisis and why it could happen again. He claims Democrats in charge of the Financial Commission made up their minds from the start to blame everything on the banks, not the government. It's been cemented into uh, the public mind that the big banks on Wall Street were responsible for the financial crisis. And that's wrong. In fact, it was government housing policy that caused the financial crisis, and the Commission refused to look seriously into that issue. As a former Citigroup executive, Bowen says he remains convinced that bank executives should have paid a price for the misrepresentations by their institutions. What's the lesson in all of this? If we do not hold people accountable, then we're going to see the same behavior. In the 1980s and the banking and SNL crisis, we sent over 800 senior bankers to jail. This crisis, which is a factor of 70 times worth, I think it may be greater than that, we have sent no one to jail. And, and I think we basically are saying there's no downside to doing this. The Democrat-appointed chairman of the Financial Commission, Phil Angelides, told me the big banks used hardball tactics against him and other committee members. Still, he says the criminal referrals the commission made prove they did their job without fear or favor. Ahead on full measure, millions of men take them, but what about the side effects of impotence pills? We turn now to a possible serious side effect from popular erectile dysfunction, or ED, drugs. But first, a few stats. Since Viagra was first approved to treat impotence in 1998, tens of millions of men have taken ED drugs, including Cialis and Levitra. In 2015 alone, Pfizer reported $1.2 billion in revenue from Viagra. As with all medicine, there are potential risks, including rarely permanent blindness. The eye doctor who first uncovered the link tells us how he discovered it by listening to a patient more than a decade ago. Viagra helps guys with ED get and keep an erection. The patient used the drug um, shortly before wanting to initiate sex, actually didn't have sex, um, but noticed within, within an hour or less after taking the drug that he lost vision in one eye. Um, and to me, that's something that's just beyond just circumstance. Dr. Howard Pomerantz is a neuro-ophthalmologist and associate professor at the Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine in New York. It's very serious, but at the time, at least the erectile dysfunction medicine had no such warning or hint of this. Correct. Pomerantz began to hear about similar cases and in 2005 published reports of 14 patients who went blind shortly after taking Viagra. That's when I began investigating, and in May 2005 broke the news that the FDA was in serious talks with Pfizer to list blindness under possible risks. Less than two months later, labels on Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra added warnings about permanent loss of vision from blood flow blocked to the optic nerve. Stop taking Viagra and call your doctor right away if you experience a sudden decrease or loss in vision or hearing. At the time, the pharmaceutical industry put the warnings on the label, but insisted they really didn't think there was a link. Correct, because this disease, ischemic optic neuropathy, has been associated with circulatory problems in the body, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, and other conditions. And it's sometimes difficult to separate those confounding factors that a lot of patients who have ED have already. So the FDA asked the three manufacturers at the time to conduct a study to try to answer this question. The FDA mandated that each of these three drug companies perform a prospective study. In the decades since, only Pfizer has released its FDA-mandated study. Published in 2015, it confirmed the possible blindness connection. But Dr. Pomeranz says few ophthalmologists read about it. So the Pfizer study, when it was finally released, found what sort of risk? So they calculated approximately a two-fold risk of developing ischemic optic neuropathy within a 24-hour period after using 
Viagra or one of the other similar ED drugs. Over somebody that's not taking it. Correct. That's a significant risk in the medical world? It is. I have patients who will ask me, you know, what is my risk of developing this problem if I take one of these drugs? Now at least I can tell patients there's some research that shows that there is some significant risk of you developing this problem after you, after you take the drug, if you're someone who has risk factors for developing this problem. Pfizer updated its warning label to reflect its new study. We asked Pfizer if it's fair to say that its own study and label now indicate a link between Viagra and blindness. Pfizer pointed to the FDA-approved label, which says it's not possible to determine whether the cases of blindness are related directly to the drug or other factors. Pfizer also told us this issue is rare and that there is no scientific certainty with regard to the cause. But Dr. Pomeranz found the risks could be greater than the 40 cases of blindness he says Pfizer identified. I did some research into the FDA adverse events reporting database and found that there are literally hundreds of cases that have been reported to the FDA of ischemic optic neuropathy related to um, ED drug use. I think it's vastly underreported. Since it's eye specialists, not the doctors who prescribe Viagra, who are most likely to see patients with vision loss, Dr. Pomeranz got the word out to fellow ophthalmologists at a recent conference. What was the response of your audience when you presented the numbers? They were aghast because, again, the um, peer review literature only shows uh, 40 cases or so. The fact that there are hundreds of cases out there that have been reported to the FDA um, I think just made people aware that, you know, we just don't know how many cases of this are, are out there. And to be clear, you're not saying that people shouldn't use ED drugs? No, not at all. But I think people need to be aware that there's a potential risk to, to their vision if they, they use one of these drugs. The makers of Levitra told us there's no conclusive evidence of a link. The makers of Cialis say blindness is very rare and its study is finished but not yet released. Next on Full Measure, some say a cyber war is underway, so why are some of our top agencies rejecting some of the best recruits? Claims of Russian election hacking continue to make headlines in the U.S. and Europe, serving as a reminder that one of the greatest threats we face is from cyber warfare. But when it comes to recruiting soldiers to do battle in the war on the web, the federal government could be missing some of the best talent. Full Measure contributor Josie Sturman has the surprising reason why. John Chase is never going to fit the mold of a button-down FBI agent. He didn't go to college, he admits he used recreational drugs, and he has a criminal record. Chase does have one vital component in his skill set. In just one day, he developed a program to dig through social media data and expose thousands of accounts linked to ISIS. He published a list that went viral, disabling one of their most successful propaganda and recruiting tools. How's it feel to take on the largest terrorist organization in the world? Scary. <laughs> it's definitely, definitely nerve wracking. Uh, when we were writing the script and compiling the list, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. But, you know, when we published the list and the media became so interested in it and then it became apparent that ISIS knew who we were, and that, that was definitely a moment of, oh God, you know. Chase worked as part of the group Anonymous, a loose collective of hackers. Hello, citizens of the world. We are anonymous. Made famous by a number of notorious hacks, including platform. infiltrating top-level pro-Kremlin activists, successfully disabling the website for Greece's central bank, even exposing personal information that belongs to presidential hopeful Donald Trump. Chase claims his work drew the attention of some top-level and top-secret agencies interested in his particular skill set. The problem, even if he wanted to go legit, he falls into what the government calls unclearable talent. The hurdle, at least for the FBI, four questions to pass the background check. Have you used marijuana at all within the last three years? Have you used any other illegal drug in the past 10 years, have you ever sold any illegal drug, and have you ever used any prescription drug in a manner for which it was not intended within the past three years? What do you think when you hear all of those questions? God, I, I can't imagine one person I know who, who would have the skill set to actually fulfill that job that would meet all those criteria. 
I know I wouldn't. It's that culture clash that's keeping hackers with sorely needed skills, hackers like Chase, on the dark side. We're trying to do a better job, right? We're trying to increase the candidate pool, but yeah, there's that baseline that we are not willing to uh, go below. David Johnson leads cybersecurity operations for the FBI. He says there's a lot of discussion at the Bureau about changing times and the changing threat. Hackers say for the feds, keeping up may require looking at the potential talent pool a little differently, mining social media and the dark web, a place intentionally hidden from almost all eyes and accessed by the few with highly technical tools. If that's where they are, if that's where they play, why not go after them there? Yeah, that's where that's where some of them play. There's there's uh, no doubt about that. But from my perspective, there is uh, plenty of equally good talent um, that. Uh, is not quite so hard to access. The second big hurdle to attracting hackers is money. And whoever said crime doesn't pay never hacked on the dark web. I think the best people are on the black cat side. And you know, a lot of that's probably financial driven. You know, obviously there's a lot more money in committing internet crimes than uh, you know, working for the government. But um, you know, a lot of people would probably forego some of that money if they had the opportunity to do something good. Just some of the work that they would have an opportunity to do. It is really cool and um, eye-opening. Let me put it that way. Name recognition can't be beat. But it may take more than a badge to bridge these two cultures. And somewhere between the metaphors of black hats and white hats, real talent to address a real threat may be missed. I mean, you're putting somebody on a computer. They're not walking around with a gun. They're not arresting citizens. They're on a computer. And, you know, if this is the person that's qualified to do the job, then they should be the person that's doing it. This is a fairly big problem for the FBI. They tell us of the 10,800 applicants they screened last year, 4,200 couldn't get past the background check. That's nearly 40% that couldn't be cleared. For Full Measure, I'm Josie Sturman. Coming up, a look ahead to next week's stories and our report on Afghanistan's ghost soldiers. Next week on Full Measure, our engagement in Afghanistan. It's not just about big bombs and fighting Islamic extremist terrorists. It also includes paying for ghost soldiers with your tax dollars. When you say ghosts, what are you referring to? Well, we're talking about policemen, Afghan policemen, Afghan military, Afghan civil servants who don't exist or they have multiple identity cards and we're paying their salaries. An incredible story of wasted U.S. tax dollars on the next full measure. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching. Until then, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable.